Good evening and welcome to Iron Government, a production of the Agency for Public Information. I am Bavin Alver. This evening, Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture, the Honorable Carlos James, outlines his plans to take tourism forward. Work underway to once again transform the Botanic Gardens into a sea of lights. ACE 2 becomes the first business to begin operations at the new shopping center at E.T. Joshua. These and other stories are ahead, but first, let's join the API's Yinka Goodluck for Newswatch. Good evening and welcome to the Newswatch segment. I am Yinka Goodluck. The Ministry of Education continues to make school safety a priority. As such, the Safe School Unit conducted a safe school assessment on Tuesday, November 24th for teachers along with other persons in the public and private sector. This is the third workshop that will be held in relation to safe school assessment. We had a training in July of last year, and we had an up training in February of this year. We are looking to upscale the school safety assessment program, and so we are providing this opportunity to have a refresher for our assessors before going out in the field. As you would realize that school safety and school safety assessment is not just the role of the Ministry of Education. So as part of our assess assessment and our assessors are part of various ministries and entities. So we do have persons from the private sector, we have from other ministry department, and some persons have been trained. And so over the next two days, we will form teams with different skill sets who will go out to assess our schools. The assessment provides schools with an independent look at the school climate and culture as it relates to enhancing the learning environment. The workshop was held at the Ministry of Education's conference room and upon completion, the participants were awarded certificates. The Bookerman Bay Secondary School is the recipient of a new talk shop and home economics quarters. The project, which was carried out by the Buildings, Roads and General Services Authority, Braxel, saw the demolition of an old timber structure being replaced with a brand new concrete building. Included in the construction of the new quarters was the retrofitting of the electrical and plumbing and also the painting of the building. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines Coast Guard Service will be celebrating its 40th anniversary of existence on December 2, 2020, with a week of activities in recognition of this milestone. The formation of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Coast Guard Service within the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force was established on December 2, 1980. The week of activities commences on Sunday, November 29, 2020, with a church service at the Kaliakwa Anglican Church and culminates on Friday, December 4, 2020, with a Coast Guard anniversary social at the Coast Guard base in Kaliakwa. Commander Brenton Kane extends sincere thanks and gratitude to the general public for their continuous and relentless support to the SVG Coast Guard service over the past 40 years. The Police Cooperative Credit Union, PCCU, has once again partnered with the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force, RSVGPF, in sponsoring the annual Police Christmas Caroling Contest. The PCCU has been sponsoring the contest since 2012. A check of $5,000 was handed over to the Commissioner of Police, Colin John, to offset expenses for this year's contest by manager of the PCCU, Ayana Samuel. The PCCU has been in existence for the past 17 years and membership is open to members of the general public. In accepting the check, 
Commissioner John expressed gratitude to the PCCU on behalf of the police force. The Center for Enterprise Development, Inc., CED, in collaboration with the Savings Bank Foundation for International Cooperation, SBFIC, held a one-week training seminar on November 23, 2020, to commemorate the Global Entrepreneurship Week 2020, under the theme, Preparing the Next Generation of Entrepreneurs. 17 students and a teacher from the Barley Technical Institute, Bartek, were the recipients of the one-week training in design thinking to develop a business. Design thinking is a new approach to help entrepreneurs develop their business ideas. It is a reflective toolkit that focuses on people and customers and offers a variety of tools and methods to create and develop innovative business ideas. The workshop was delivered by CED's technical team, who were trained as trainers by SBFIC. And finally, Lieutenant of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Coast Guard Service, William Thibbles, has achieved a new milestone, becoming the first Vincentian to complete the International Maritime Operations course at the United States Naval War College, Newport, Rhode Island. Lieutenant Thibbles, who has 26 years of experience as a Coast Guard officer, graduated on November 6, 2020. He noted that the program was informative and provided insights of previous maritime operations, including Operation Neptune, the largest amphibious landing to take place in history. He further expressed how elated he was about his achievement and is looking forward to greater things. The International Maritime Operators course was a 12-week program which prepares naval officers to support the planning and execution of complex maritime operations in a coalition environment. Thanks for viewing Newswatch. Stay with us as the API's Ion government continues with Bavin Oliver. I am Yinka Goodluck. As parents, we have the responsibility to ensure that our child or children are safe and ready for the reopening of school. In this phase of reopening, all confirmed cases of COVID-19 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are imported or import-related, with no community spread. However, while we strive to achieve some level of normalcy, we highly recommend adherence and compliance. As we continue together to reduce the risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus, talk to your child to reinforce what is expected of him or her during this time. Remind your child to wash their hands frequently with soap and running water. In the absence of such, a 70% alcohol-based hand sanitizer can be used. If both are absent, children are advised to keep their unwashed hands out of their eyes, nose and mouth. Cover their nose and mouth when sneezing or coughing with a tissue and immediately dispose of it. In the absence of tissue, sneeze or cough into their elbow, not their hands. As parents, we also have a responsibility to ensure that your child or children's temperature is checked and recorded. If a temperature reading is 38 degrees Celsius or 100.1 degrees Fahrenheit and above, please call the COVID-19 hotline and a healthcare provider will advise you accordingly. If the reading is below, your child is good to go. During school, if they are unwell, they should report it to the teacher or parent immediately. If you or your child are experiencing any flu-like symptoms, please stay at home and call your nearest health center and share your history. A healthcare provider will talk you through the procedures to follow. Children who must take public transportation should wear face mask coverings en route, one for the morning journey and another for after school. The flu and coronavirus, COVID-19, can cause serious illnesses, even death. Please protect yourself and your family. Welcome back. You are watching Iron Government.
the revamping of various tourism sites, as well as a renewed focus on sustainable growth and development in the tourism sector, were just some of the exciting developments outlined by the Minister of Tourism, the Honorable Carlos James. Minister James was at the time speaking at the Thanksgiving service held at the Kingston Methodist Church on Monday. Here's more. A sustainable tourism industry packed with our indigenous heritage, rich culture, and a picturesque beauty is the vision of the new Minister of Tourism, Sustainable Development, Civil Aviation, and Culture, Honorable Carlos James. Minister James was speaking at the opening of Tourism Week 2020 on Monday, 23 November, at the Kingsdown Methodist Church. With passion and a sense of urgency, Minister James expressed his vision for the upcoming years as we prepare for full return of the sector after COVID. In the coming year, we begin to embark on a number of programs, remedial programs, such as the refurbishment of the, the um, Fort Charlotte and a number of other forts um, in the Grenadines. We look at improving a number of the tourism sites, particularly on the Leeward side, which undoubtedly has the best um, tourism eco sites. And we're talking about Trinity Fall and Darkview Fall and all the other beaches and, and coves that are existed on mainland. Because when we look at maybe 2022, 23, which is the projected period when we are going to see a rebound in the industry, we have to be ready, we have to be competitive, and we have to be focused. And also culture plays an important role. I see Ezzy and I see Randy and all the other persons here, Rodney. We have to marry culture within a more significant way, within the packages and the programs that we offer. Because when I go up to Fort Charlotte, I would like to see a reenactment of Chateau and the, the, the British. When I go to Rosebank, which is one of the um, last indigenous villages on the leeward side, I would like to see the quadrille and the artifacts, as well as the craft. And when I go to Sandy Bay and Fancy, I would like to see reenactments of the Garifuna and the music and the language. And the modern tourist is, is not really just interested in sun, sea, and sand, but they want to see what our country has to offer. They want to see our indigenous nature, our people. They want to see how we live and how we existed. And a historic account of that, we have to live and, and rebuild the tourism brand and restructure the brand so that we can cover all of these things um, in a fulsome way. There has been an increased focus on domestic tourism since the onset of COVID-19. And Minister James, in a very real and profound way, brought home the point of tourism being everyone's business. Just yesterday, I, I went fishing perhaps the first time in months after a busy period of, of political work. And what really hit home to me was a lot of us of incentions. A lot of these stakeholders within the industry are facing some very challenging times, and we have to acknowledge that. How many of us, though we have our motor vehicles, but how many of us would call a taxi maybe once a week or once a month and say, let me take a taxi from home to work today? Because as simple as you do that, it puts a dollar in a taxi operator's hand. Many of us were no longer able to travel to Miami or New York during a holiday period. But how many of us would say, we have a birthday coming up, let's stay at a hotel, a local hotel, or let's go to a restaurant to dine tonight. Let's not cook tonight, but let's go out and have a meal. And you might think that also it doesn't bear on, on you know, what we do as a country, but as simple as that, uh, gestures of that nature, putting aside one day per week or one day per month based on your finances, is contributing to the economy, is contributing to the stakeholders in the economy, and will play a significant role in, as the theme said, tourism is our business. We cannot just depend on the tourists who's coming to spend, but we also, we need to support the, the industry and by extent in supporting the industry, we support the economy. 
and I encourage and employ all stakeholders. Let us encourage the use of our tourism sites, our services, our taxi operators, our restaurants, our hotels, our beaches. And even the beaches, when we go, for instance, in Darkview Fall, I know there's a small pittance that you contribute, and also I see my good friend from the Botanic Gardens, you pay a small fee to go in, but there are some locals who will complain and say, well, why do I have to pay? I live here. Paying $1 or $5, I don't know what the charge is, but just that one contribution is going to enhancing that site, having a sustainable environment in which we can function and flourish as an industry is an important and important role. And I ask that if we don't take anything away from this week of activities, is that we take this message away, that we all have that important role to play in contributing to our economy. And that is by supporting the stakeholders and ensuring that their livelihoods are also protected. Because while we may have a safe job, they themselves have to depend on income from the services sector that is surrounding the tourism industry. And by and large, I want to encourage all of us to use that as an example and a guide going forward. Tourism Week continued today with a beach cleanup at the Fitzhugh's Beach. And on Friday, members of the ministry as well as stakeholders across the sector will participate in a scavenger hunt and hike at Zion Hill in Barley. Tamara Barrow, for Eye on Government. The Botanic Gardens is expected to come alive once again with spectacular lights. More when we return. Read, learn, grow. The children of the future help them read, learn, grow. Early reading is the key, so help them read, learn, grow. Let's show them how much fun it is to read, learn, grow. So parents, you play your part. First and foremost, reading from so young is advantageous. Link with the teachers. Working hand in hand is a must. Just 10 minutes of your child reading to you is a plus. Get fun books, make reading priority. When children read, they are able to learn. And the more they learn, the more they grow. So parents help the kids read, learn, grow. Reading is fun, kids have to know. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. So parents, you play your part. This message is brought to you by the OECS USAID Early Learners Program, funded by United States Agency for International Development. For more information, log on to www.oecs.org ELP. Welcome back. The National Parks, Rivers and Beaches Authority is once again spearheading nine nights of lights under the theme, A Botanical Christmas. The Botanic Gardens will come alive on December 15, 2020 with the launch of this year's Nine Nights of Lights. The API's Kisha Woodley spoke with curator of the gardens, Garden Shallow, to get a feel of what goes into making Nine Nights a true botanical Christmas. For the past six years, the staff and management of the Botanical Gardens has spearheaded Nine Nights lights of, of lights. lights. It's kind of tricky, but you get it. And we are going to talk to Mr. Shallow today about the process thus far and what we can look forward to for this year's Nine Nights of Lights. Well, thank you, Kisha, and um, welcome to all our viewers out there. Um, the process uh, thus far for our Nine Nights of Lights, um, once you repeat it enough, you, you, you will get it, Nine Nights of Lights, um, similar to Nine Mornings, so it's Nine Nights. Um, we are going ahead, we're bolstering ahead with uh, all of the Herculean tasks that we have to do in putting up the many variant types of lights and uh, different fixtures. Um, as we span around, um, you'll see workers uh, busy, very much industrious, um, getting the work done, uh, putting up lights uh, in the pond area, on trees, um, in our walkways and so forth. So we are still going ahead uh, very speedily with just a little over two weeks to go before our launch on the 15th of December. Yes, six years have really flown. I can't believe we've gone six years already. If we are to go back, what's the inspiration behind the Nine Nights of Lights? Um, well, that's a very good question. Um, the Nine Nights of Lights started um, in 2015 when the gardens were celebrating the, its 250th um, anniversary of existence. 
and as part of the uh, calendar year of activities that um, I helped to engineer and so on, uh, I, I thought of an event for December that would really encapsulate um, us as a people and help us to really celebrate and be very um, momentous of the gardens. And I draw inspiration, I drew inspiration from my childhood. I remembered uh, my grandmother, our late foster grandmother, uh, uh, German Rose, persons who may know as Granny Rose um, from YWC. And she often talked about her younger days and coating and being in the gardens and moonlight nights and coating. so forth. Coating, yes, coating, yes. <laughs> Young people don't say coating, it was a dating. And I, I remembered that and that, that really uh, stuck with me. And um, lo and behold, years later, I am now the curator at the gardens. And as I said, with the celebrating of the 250th anniversary, I, I thought of that and I realized that in the Botanical Gardens Act, as it is by law, the gardens can be opened for moonlight nights. So I sort of twinned the two together as, you know, commemorating her and um, basically um, bringing people to the gardens, which, which in our days was not a very common thing to come during the night. So I thought it'd be very nice. Added to that, there's a little other backdrop um, where uh, just a few years prior, a year or two prior, um, there was a little, I don't want to say controversy, but a little bit of a, a debate within the region and even a little outside of the region where other countries were, trying, were copying St. Vincent, mm -hmm. you know, our nine, nine, our nine mornings, sorry, and were questioning if it was something uniquely Vincentian. And with that as well too came the thought and I, I said, well, if persons are wondering if nine mornings is Vincentian or not, and they're also celebrating nine mornings, similar to us. Well, we're going to do something definitely that is truly Vincentian and started um, by Vincentian. We're going to do nine nights okay. of lights, and hence the name. We still have um, our opening night um, where we're going to have the, the police band come in. We're going to have different uh, performances on the opening night. Uh, this year, uh, I would hasten to say that um, we are finally going to uh, have a steel pan around the neck. We'll would be um, marching around the gardens and so forth, having asking the patrons to come along. Conga that, line? Uh, sort of conga line. You, you, um, yes, yes. I would that, like to see this. <laughs> well, not conga line in its true sense, but yes, to basically have um, patrons go around the mm -hmm. gardens. Mm -hmm. um, that and is something. Exercise as well, eh? Well, it, well, Put if on you want soft, to, march on your sneakers and come. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, you know, in the old time days, um, growing up, you'll hear steel pan going around, caroling around in the in, in the, the neighborhood and so forth, which, um, at least to my knowledge, doesn't really happen that much now. So it's it's basically in that essence that we want to um, bring that back, and you know, have the patrons go around um, the gardens. Mm. <laughs> Can you just remind us of some general rules that patrons need to adhere to when they come to the gardens, not only to see the lights, but generally? Um, well, the gardens uh, is a wildlife reserve. Um, it's been covered under the Wildlife Reserve Act and its own Act, the Botanical Gardens Act. Um, the essence is that persons, when they come, um, feel free to enjoy the gardens, but do not uh, damage. Uh, the plants and the surroundings in any which way uh, do not vandalize, so no breaking of um, branches, leaves, picking of flowers and fruits and the like, uh, no littering and, and so forth. Uh, so we want to encourage persons to adhere to that, um, even and especially during nine nights of light, and just basically come and enjoy, enjoy the place. We are with the curator and the architect behind this whole nine nights of lights, Mr. Charles Peely Delplish. He sounds as if he belongs to the royal house, eh? Charles, tell us, how do you do this? Well, it's since um, about this hour, four, four years now. Yeah, four, four years, years that me. he's been. And I've been doing this, this yeah. thing. First thing we do, we do a bamboo thing, come up this way. Then from that we change to kanji. Then last day we do a a pole here so and then with this year we're going to do it different 
we now use some small conduit and we now use a, another long piece of pole up in the between the so. So you're going to run lights along the pole? Yeah, everything when I get light. The conduit when I bend over from the edge of the pan, bend over to meet the other, the center. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the, the one in the center now going up in the mm -hmm. or like it will be coming off of that coming down on the ground to the end of the pan pan. I think I'm getting the vision here. Charles <laughs> So you go we go and you just point me out. So don't worry, we'll fix it. So what kind of experience do you have? It's not as if you have some no, electrical no, skills going on. No, I got I have a little bit of experience about carpentry. And I do it already with Mr. Ashop Lumans. You know? I got it one time with him. So from the I get the, the experience and start to learn. Every time I do something, I'm learning something different. You know? That's good. Yeah. Every time I do something, I'm doing something different. And then coming here, you know, with a shallow employee to do this, <laughs> to do this thing, you know? Well, well you see, um, Del Pleasure Pili here is one of our main guys who um, manicures the lawn, you know? We have a lot of other workers, but he's one of the very skilled guys. And sometimes you have to explore the other skills that your workers may have. And quite early on, I realized that he's a handyman. While he's mentioning a bit of his joinery skills, I would say he's an all-rounder. You understand? It's, it's, it's through that gem that we have here in Mr. Delplesh. You know, so I always like to put him on the forefront, you know, where he could display skills and talent. And he has been, that's why I call him Kisha, the architect, because we will have an idea and, and we'll, 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 we'll figure out, okay, we want this, we want that. But he will engineer how a certain thing should be done or what the material we should use to get that idea done. So I just want to make sure, give him the codes and, 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 and put him in the spot a bit so people could see and appreciate the kind of skilled, uh, talented workers that we have in the gardens. Very good. You hear that, Mr. Pilly? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're getting your roses while you're alive. Amen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you help, you direct the guys what to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do the, show them what to do. I join with them and I work together. And so far, you have a very good team, cooperative, yeah. everything going good. Yeah, no, no argument. Good, very yeah. good. We do a, a sort of appraisal meeting after every um, nine nights, you know, what are the things that we got good, where we could have improved and so forth. And shortly after that, um, we then start to plan. We typically would plan, uh, start planning about uh, February, March, um, to have a, a basic idea of what we would be doing um, for that particular year. Wow, you start very early, that's good. So, as you said, you will start, you'll have a launch on the 15th on of December. On the 15th of December. At what time? We, the gates will be open from 6, but the actual uh, program would start at 7, and we go from the 15th to the 23rd. And the launch, to get in on the launch, it's free? Um, no, thank, thank you for that. Um, the adults is an admission fee, um, because it's quite costly. The gardens on, a, on, on its regular day-to-day -day operation is quite costly, so we have uh, an entrance uh, fee, $5 for adults, uh, and uh, for nine nights it's going to be the same, $5, and for children we'll be uh, charging $2. Okay. And there will be food and snacks and lots drinks? Lots of food, lots of drinks. Um, we tend to focus a lot on the traditional uh, Christmas eats and treats mm -hmm. and so forth. Madongo? Uh, Madongo is, is, is a must. Almost every activity that we host here in the gardens ourselves, we have modongo oh, there. We have enough, enough. Well, so I don't think Madongo we could have enough fast. because I, I will tell you this, Kisha, even myself, I'm a lover of modongo. <laughs> and although there is your barbecue at the side and the mm -hmm. pork and the ham and the sorrel and, 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 and the, um, the, the black cake and so on, most people tend to line up on the Madongo line that's, first. That's always as a the longest first thing. line. Yes, that's the first thing they go for, and then they go to um, the, the, the other stuff. So just wanted the opportunity to shout out um, Inga from uh, Owea, Ingrid from Owea. Um, she does a lovely Madongo, so I know persons, patrons are going to come out mm -hmm. to get some of that again. Okay, good. So if you have to sum up this year's Nine Nights of Lights in a word, what word would that be? Fabulous. Fabulous. 
So people, you've heard it, expect fabulous, can we say, can we coin a new word? Fabulosity. Fabulosity. <laughs> for this year's Nine Nights of Light. Thank you so much, Gordon, for Thank talking to us. Thank you very much. I hope that everyone comes out this year to see whether all of the nights or at least one night of nine nights of light and we have a visitor so thank you and all the best thank you you're welcome Correa's hazels unwraps an early christmas gift with the opening of ace 2 and pharmacy 2 at ichi joshua more when we return Marine and Coastal Rehabilitation Adaptation Project. Located south of the island, extending to over five bays, White Sands, Kanash, Kaliakwa, Villa, and Indian Bay. Let's improve aquatic life. A message from the National Parks, Rivers, and Beaches Authority and partners. Welcome back. Careers Hazel Inc. will ring in the Yuletide season in fine style with the relocation of Ace 2 and Careers Pharmacy 2 at the E.T. Joshua site. As the first enterprise to set up shop at the E.T. Joshua, Correa's Hazels has set a very high precedent. Earlier today, Correa's held the official opening with a ceremony. Representatives of the company and national properties, among others, spoke at the ceremony. Correa's Hazel Inc. officially opened their Ace 2 Correa's Pharmacy earlier today in grand style. Their relocation to the decommissioned E.T. Joshua Airport is part of the extension of Capital Kingstown. Already, customers are patronizing this newly relocated branch of Corey's. Name. Building and Supplies Manager Brian George said it brought them great satisfaction to move to the new facility and that this is not just a relocation. George explained that they outgrew their old location, which they had occupied for 12 years. The Correa's Hazels Inc. Building and Supplies Manager described the new facility as offering more warehouse and parking spaces. Strategically, Correa's Hazels continues daily in its efforts to serve our customers and improve the customer experience. Just about a year ago, we opened a new Ace 3 Express store in the Pembroke area. And now, less than a year afterwards, we've relocated, expanded, and opened a new store in Arnesville. Customer demands are ever-changing, and typically expectations are very high for quality service. And we strive always to meet those expectations. We are always held in particular to high standards, and we believe that our efforts here at the New Ace 2 store have and will continue to meet those high expectations. It's not my job here to perform the vote of thanks, that shall come later, but I wish to publicly thank Mr. Hans King for, and the National Properties for working along with us on this venture. I'm sure he already takes great pleasure in instructing for the issuance of our monthly rental checks. <laughs> also, many thanks to the members of staff who have worked tirelessly and extremely hard on this project. This project, for all intents and purposes, was implemented in-house with in-house staff and in-house expertise. Some of our regional colleagues continue to be surprised by this fact. And finally, and very importantly, a big thank you to our customers for their patience and forbearance with us during this move. As usual, we at Correa's are leading and showing the way forward. We have latched on to government's vision and enabling environment, and hopefully we shall con continue to exceed our customers' expectations. Manager of National Properties, Hans King, gave a description of what is in store for the mall. The work doing, being done on the remainder of the building, though, is a bit more complex. Uh, and you will get an opportunity, I believe, a few months or maybe even next month. I'm an optimist. I'm still hoping that before Christmas that 
the rest of the mall may be open and you can do your shopping there. But inside on the other side, what we have is about 10 stores. Uh, I won't call the name of those stores at the moment. And you will have ATM service, you will have banking service inside. The old tower that you see above, that will be transformed into a bar offering light finger foods. And of course, you have the old restaurant at the top on the other end that will also be transformed into a brand new high-end restaurant when we are completed. There is also another building that is going to be at the end of this extern this terminal building, the existing terminal building that will come across, it will form an L shape. That building, we also have a tenant, a major furniture store that will be on the ground floor of that building and on the top floor of that building will be five food courts with open seating. So when this entire project is finished, you are going to have a marvelous, marvelous edifice here at the old E.T. Joshua Airport. Managing Director of Correa's Hazels Inc., Joel Providence, said they are here to open the ACE 2 Correa's Pharmacy 2 at the Joshua Center because of the vision of Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Ralph Consols. And who shared this vision with the Vincentian public back in August of 2005? And this vision relates to the development of an international airport here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the resulting decommissioning of this E.T. Joshua building. So we are here by the grace of God and also through the vision of Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez. Today, we at Careers thank you all for being here to mark this occasion, the opening of this, our second store in less than 12 months, as Brian George would have mentioned. By this time next year, we hope to add yet another, and then within two years, a fourth. It is within our strategic vision to bring our service to the people. We do so because we believe in ourselves, and we believe in the future of this country. So here we are today. We are pleased to be the first store of many that will emerge in this shopping and ledger center and then across the runway divide. To my mind, it has been a partnership that was honest, well-meaning, symbiotic, and perfectly professional. Thank you to Hans King. We want to move on to new projects at Diamond, and I do hope that we'll be able to receive the kind consideration of planning of the Ministry of Finance and of the Cabinet for the twin developments at Diamond working together under the singular banner, the sister companies, Correa's Hazels and Correa's Distribution. And I recognize the presence of Mr. Jimmy Ford, our, the CEO of CDL. Providence presented a background on the foundation on which Correa's Hazel was built. This year, we are quietly commemorating without pomp and ceremony the 175th anniversary of a career's genealogical antecedent, Hazel's Limited. We go all the way back to 1845, and we have come a long way. Memorial plaques are actually deeply embedded in the walls of the Anglican Church in Kingston, reflecting the names of the founders of this company. Back then, and just seven years after slavery had ended, the founders, for sure, did not look anything like me. We have come a long way. 100 years later, in 1945, shortly after the end of the Second World War, the company held a function to celebrate the 100th anniversary and to celebrate its staff. The function took place at the Sugar Mill Inn, and the company then had gone through a very bad patch. The war had brought hardship on town and country, on the poor, and also on the merchant class as well. This was compounded by the fact that Hazels had lost a, a building in a fire in Kingston that very year in 1945 but the company still had its faithful and loyal staff. And at the function then, the managing director said 
that they had lost business and they would have lost customers, but never could it be said that the company lost business or customers as a result of substandard service from its faithful employees. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonsalves congratulated all those who were involved on the project. He said he's very happy with the move by Correa's Hazels Inc. and that the government has a good partnership with them. I want to make a comment about something which Joel said. I hope the press picked it up. This is a man who is speaking on behalf of a big regional company which invests in a lot of money in St. Vincent. He said that his company has confidence in the institutional arrangements and the functioning and the policies of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That's what he just said here, you know. I didn't know you were going to say that, but I listened very carefully. And that is confirmation with the investments which people are bringing in into St. Vincent Grenadines. Home Improvement Manager of Correa's Hazels Inc., Debbie Huggins, delivered the vote of thanks. Reporting for the agent... There you have it, folks. The opening ceremony for the Correa's Hazels Inc. Ace 2 and Correa's Pharmacy 2 at the decommissioned E.T. Joshua Airport site. The site has many more future developments in store, including an acute referral hospital, a mall, a boutique hotel, and many other features. Look for it, folks. They are coming. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I am Keisha Woodley. Councillor at the Ministry of Health, Wellness and Environment shared some tips with persons living with diabetes on how they can maintain good mental health. More when we return. As we applaud the efforts of the Ministry of Health, Wellness and Environment in managing the spread of COVID-19, we wish to remind you to follow all the protocols. Most importantly, practice proper hand washing, Cover your cough and sneeze in the crook of your elbow. Do not touch your face. Wear a mask when in public or where it is not possible to practice social distancing. Call the COVID-19 hotline at 534-4325 if you are experiencing flu-like symptoms. Together, we can stop the spread of COVID-19. A message by the National Reconciliation Advisory Committee. Welcome back. You're watching Iron Government. Diabetes is known to have negative impact on one's physical health. However, the disease can also create mental issues for persons living with the condition. Counsel with the Ministry of Health, Odelia Thomas, highlighted how persons living with diabetes can maintain both physical and mental health. Good day everyone, my name is Odila Thomas and I'm a counselor in the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. And today I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk about the psychosocial effects of diabetes. Diabetes just doesn't affect someone physically, it also affects them psychologically and socially. And you may be asking why. It requires a frequent monitoring of your blood sugar levels careful consideration of your activity and nutrition and this places a lot of demands on the person living with diabetes. So it can affect your mental health, your well-being and your quality of life. So some of the factors that can be affected with a person living with diabetes are your environmental and social factors. So for example, your finances will determine your nutrition what sorts of vegetables you can buy, what sort of food you can buy. Your clinic attendance, which is your behavioral factor, also affects how well you live with diabetes. 
and your emotional factors would include things like how you cope with pain and stress. Also, somebody living with diabetes might have a fear of needles. I know I do. So that person might be afraid when they go to the clinic, they might be afraid of the needle, they might be afraid that when they check their blood sugar that it might be low or it might be too high, and then they start worrying about the complications of living with diabetes. So the burden of these thoughts every day, day in and day out, can really affect someone's mental health. And as such, many persons living with diabetes are affected by depression and anxiety. When it comes to depression, it affects how somebody thinks, how they live, how they act, and how they feel. But fortunately, it is treatable with counseling and or medication depending on how severe your symptoms are. If you have diabetes, you are at a greater risk for developing depression and the rigors of managing diabetes, the constant testing of your glucose levels, having to monitor your nutrition and your exercise can be very stressful and lead to symptoms of depression. In turn, depression can lead to poor lifestyle decisions. For example, if you're feeling really down and depressed, you might not want to get out of bed, you might not feel like exercising, you might not feel like eating all the vegetables. When I feel down, I want ice cream. So somebody who's living with diabetes, eating ice cream and cookies and cake all the time will affect your blood sugar levels. So depression can lead to poor lifestyle choices. Depression can also affect your ability to perform certain tasks, such as communicating and successfully managing your diabetes. Anxiety, on the other hand, is a normal reaction to stress. However, when it becomes a problem is when it involves excessive fear and anxiety, which affects how you function in your daily life. So what can we do to manage depression and anxiety while living with diabetes? Stay connected to the ones you love. Right now, a lot of people have cellular phones. We have access to the internet in most communities. Call your loved ones, send them a text message, stay connected to them. Join a support group. Many clinics have a diabetes and hypertension support group. Join a support group where you will be surrounded by persons who are living with the same illness as you and who can support you. Do things that make you feel good. Whatever that is, positive things, do things that make you feel good. Exercise. It helps to boost your mood. It not just only helps your diabetes, but it helps you to feel good. Eat a well-balanced diet. Get a daily dose of sunlight for at least 15 minutes each day. Limit your alcohol, caffeine, and other drug intake and humor. A laugh goes a long way. So if you have diabetes, please watch out for the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety, such as losing interest in the things that you like to do, feeling really sad and hopeless, being worried and fearful about what is going on in your life. And if you think you might be depressed or anxious, seek help right away. Please talk to your doctor or the nurse in your clinic and they can refer you to a counselor for additional help. So it's a catch-22. Diabetes stresses you out and in turn, that stress worsens your diabetes. So what is stress? Stress is your body's way of responding to any kind of a demand or threat. And diabetes is seen as a demand on your body. How do we know when we're stressed out? What are the signs of knowing when you're stressed out? Sometimes you might feel dizzy or some people just say, I just feel out of it. I just don't feel like myself. You might have general aches and pains, headaches, indigestion, constipation, acid reflux symptoms. Maybe there's an increase in your appetite and for some people they may have a loss of appetite. You might have problems sleeping, your heart's racing, you may have sweaty palms, just a general feeling of tiredness, of feeling exhausted like you can't go anymore, trembling or shaking, upset stomach, diarrhea. 
So how do these things really affect our diabetes? Stress can make it more difficult to control your diabetes as it can throw off your daily routine and can result in wear and tear on your body. Hormones from stress increase your blood pressure, raise your heart rate and can actually increase your blood sugar levels. In return, having high blood sugar levels can make you feel down or tired, nervous and upset. So how does stress really affect the body when it comes to diabetes? The first thing, stress can raise your blood sugar levels. Why is it that when we are stressed out, your body feels as if maybe I haven't eaten yet? There's a number of things that goes into this, but the main thing that we want to talk about today is that stress triggers the body to release a hormone called cortisol, which is a hormone that helps your body to deal with tough situations. So when cortisol comes out to play, your heart rate and your breathing goes up. It speeds up. And then this sends glucose and protein stores from your liver into the bloodstream to make energy. In other words, your body releases sugar into the blood so that that energy can get through your nervous system. So stress results in higher blood sugar levels. Secondly, stress activates our fat cells. So that same hormone cortisol that comes out to play when we're stressed out also relocates fat from storage deposits around the body to fat cells in the abdomen. So stress actually makes you accumulate more fat around your stomach. The more stress you have, the more cortisol in your body and the more abdominal fat you will find. And these fat cells have not only been linked to a greater risk for heart disease, but also a higher risk for diabetes. Thirdly, stress contributes to insulin resistance. So this same hormone cortisol, he is doing a lot of damage here, also makes it difficult for the pancreas to secrete insulin, which is needed to move sugar out of the blood and into the cells for energy. So over time, the pancreas struggles to keep up with the high demand for insulin and the glucose levels in the blood remain high. And this contributes to insulin resistance, which you're already fighting against with diabetes. Fourthly, stress impacts sleep and this in turn impairs glucose tolerance. So sometimes when we are stressed, we are feeling anxious and it can be hard to sleep. Many studies have shown that there are negative health impacts of not getting enough sleep and diabetes is no exception. So although everyone has their own standards of what good sleep is, keep in mind that sleeping less than six hours a night has been found to contribute to impaired glucose or sugar tolerance, a condition which comes with type 2 diabetes. Add to this that when you're tired, you tend to eat more because you want to get energy from somewhere. So stress can impact your sleep, which can impact your glucose tolerance. And point number five, stress affects your blood pressure. Constant stress over time keeps the blood vessels restricted and keeps your blood pressure high. Over time, this high blood pressure can worsen many of the complications of diabetes, including diabetic eye disease and kidney disease. In fact, many people with diabetes would develop high blood pressure. It is no wonder that diabetes and hypertension often go hand in hand. So looking out for one can help prevent or alleviate the other. So how can we manage our stress? Accept that there are events that are not in our control. There are some things that we just have no control over. Accept that and learn to work with it. Learn to relax. So many times we are just on the go, always have something to do, somewhere to be, people to take care of. We need to learn to relax and take care of ourselves. Have a strong support system, persons you can lean on that can help you, especially when you're feeling stressed out. Spirituality. We live in a very 
spiritual society, putting your problems to a higher power can help you not to stress over them. Limit your use of alcohol, caffeine, and other drugs. And remember to keep your sense of humor. Laughing helps to reduce stress. I am Odelia Thomas, counselor in the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Love your body, treat it right. And that brings us to the end of the APIs and Government. Join us on Saturday for Inside Story. For further updates, visit our social media platforms at API SVG. On behalf of our production team, thanks for viewing. I am Bavin Olver.